Hi, this is Gina with Resplendent Daughter Ministries. Thanks for stopping by today. Let's open in prayer. Father, as we return to your word today, I pray that you'll open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's good to be back with you. You may or may not be aware I've been away from the um, blogging desk here and from the uh, vlogging studio for a few days. Um, last week, a week ago today, in fact, a friend of mine lost her mother suddenly. And so uh, last Wednesday and Thursday, I was out of state with my husband um, attending that funeral and supporting my friend. And then we, we returned late Thursday night, and, and on Friday I got up and had to be on the road again for a social engagement, and then Saturday morning uh, was not to be outdone. I was on the road again for another commitment, and um, then Sunday I uh, was on the road again. So the past five days, I've been going, 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 and um, so this morning uh, I, I sort of took it easy and um, it's now almost five in the afternoon before I'm making my daily vlog. So, but but it's good. It's good to get some rest. Uh, it's also good to dive back into the Word. And um, in returning, we are back in Colossians. Um, last week I left you in Colossians, and now we're returning. And um, I'm in Colossians chapter two, and I, I've perched on the first verse. For this morning's meditation, it's kind of an odd place to land today, but it says, this is Paul speaking, of course, to the Colossians, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. If you recall, the Colossian church had not ever received a visit by the Apostle Paul and neither had the Laodicean church. Do you remember that name, Laodicea? Well, Colossians was written in approximately 60 AD, and the book of Revelation, where we find extensive information about the Laodicean church, was written around 95 AD. Some 30 years passed, well, really 35, between these two scriptural mentions. When Paul alludes to the Laodicean church here in the book of Colossians, there's no hint of rebuke or condemnation in his words or his tone. He states that he's battling for them. He's contending for them. He's fighting for them in the Lord. Unfortunately, it appears that in the intervening 35 years, the Laodiceans somehow lost their fervor. Here's what Jesus said of them in Revelation chapter 3. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Wow, that's, that's a pretty harsh um, indictment, isn't it? And I won't read the rest of that passage, although you can find verses 14 through 22 in my written blog for today. I'm not going to delve into this Revelation passage in today's vlog, but um, I've included it for your reference so that you can see the decline of the Laodicean church. Instead, I'm going to share from you from my personal experience how churches get into this offensive, lukewarm state. Often it begins with some kind of conflict in the church. This should not surprise anyone. If a church is doing what the body of Christ, the bride, is supposed to do, Satan will oppose it every single time. In fact, a church needs to be worried if Satan is not opposing it because it probably means that they're not being very effective for the kingdom. The enemy knows that his time is short and so he wastes no opportunity. When that inevitable conflict comes, it comes from either outside the church or from within it. Regardless of the place of origin, if the church is healthy, the members band together to fight for righteousness until the fight is over. 
Sometimes it seems they triumph, and other times it seems that they do not. I say it seems because that's the world's perspective. If a church will recognize spiritual attack and respond appropriately, there's no losing, no matter how things appear to the world. Unfortunately, some Christians see spiritual attacks on the church as a sign of that local church's weakness. That's not necessarily true. To reiterate, attacks will come regardless of a church's overall health. There are generally various responses to these attacks. One response is that church members will cut and run at the first sign of trouble. They'll abandon their local church for another. Another response, a second response, is that those who remain will refuse to get more than minimally involved to combat the attack. These members of the body have often been badly hurt in similar attacks, and they're still too wounded to fight. They either sit passively on the sidelines or they participate in the conflict through prayer, which is a powerful weapon. A third response, response is that there are some who will fight for the truth with all they've got. They'll fight until the end. These warriors believe that without truth, the benefits of unity and peace are meaningless. Mature believers will take this approach in a loving way, but they will stand strong for truth nonetheless, even in the face of being labeled as unloving or as troublemakers. A fourth response is the response of those who place church unity above everything else. For these members of the body, the theme is unity at all costs. And regardless of the merit of the conflict, they will counsel all members of the body to look away or go along to get along or move on, move on. These members often see the local church as an organization that should be very congenial to the world, that their local church should fit in and avoid controversy. When churches refuse to engage in spiritual battles, when they just float along amicably with a godless culture in the name of a false, weak love, when they just lay down and concede spiritual ground, when there is little difference between the way the members live and the way the world operates, then a church begins to grow cold. On the bright side, going to battle together can make a church stronger in the Lord. Battling together for truth and righteousness produces true unity of purpose, increases the faith of the members, brings about spiritual victories, and advances the kingdom of our Savior. The church becomes gold refined by fire, as Jesus says in Revelation 3.18. The battle is often not pretty, and rather is often painful, in the end, though, the church becomes piping hot for God. Let's pray. Father, grant us wisdom, grant us courage, that we fail not man nor thee. May we never shirk our responsibilities to each other or to our Lord. May we never shrink back from the battles with the enemy. May all be done for the sake of truth, for the purity of the bride, in love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, thank you for stopping by today. 
I hope this vlog has been a blessing to you. And if it has, you can find more of them here at this YouTube channel. I hope you'll subscribe because you'll not only find my vlogs, you'll also find vlogs from some of my fr Christian friends who are also so gifted, even more gifted than I am at vlogging. And I'm sure that their vlogs will bless you as well. You can find the written text of my blogs at the address that is on your screen. Please reach out to me at the written blog, or you can also reach out to me on Twitter. I'd love to read your comments and to respond.